Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wimbo Worldwide F1 podcast, episode 12. And today I have with me another very popular English F1 YouTuber. I discovered him not so long ago, and it seemed like he appeared out of nowhere. He makes great long videos bantering about everything that's going on in F1, and he gets... A huge number of views well especially compared to my little channel and he does it in a very upbeat and very wholesome way i can learn a thing or two from him ladies and gentlemen give a warm welcome to law vs hi hi hello lawrence hi there yeah it's nice to be here um i'm uh i'm sorry that i didn't bring the ladder but unfortunately it's uh my 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 feet can only take so long on the ladder before it starts to get a bit like oh the arches on my feet. Oh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Honestly, well, that light bulb up there. I, I, I've only just bought it. I, I want to make it last. Right. Well, for the people that don't know Law VS, um, uh, Lawrence starts his videos by climbing up the ladder from his attic, and that's where the camera is put. Actually, it's two cameras now. No, it's the same uh, camera. Oh right. So, so you shoot that. You know, you do reshoot. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all done on the fly. Basically, I do that thing and then I move it because it's it's just this. <laughs> I use this camera. So literally, I just place it like one in front of me like that. And then all I've got to do is just move, move it over there behind the ladder. And then, and then sometimes now, and then sometimes now I've done a third angle from down below. So I'm just to prove to people because sometimes people are thinking that's not a real attic. And I'm like, yeah, it is. I'm literally on a ladder. I'm not making this up. So wh while we're on the sub subject, how, how did this happen? Oh, well, basically, I do another channel, and it's to do with the animated series Dragon Ball. And there's not a lot going on in there at the moment. And it was a case of, at the end of 2022. I was like, there's not really much going on here. And I do, I really like F1. And I'm friends with a um, an artist friend called Hayley Mulch. And she was saying, go ahead. Why don't you give it a go? And... I just thought, well, oh, OK, you know, it's Christmas, you know, it's the off season. I can just dabble in things and see how it goes. And I just gave it a shot. And Law VS is my old gamer tag from like back in the live for speed days, like 2004, 2005. Well, those were great. Those were great times, actually, because, yeah, you know, uh, it was a classic sim racing game done by um, Scarlin and oh, two other guys. But it was such a tight-knit community. It was one of the first online video games where you can actually have real time and the connection was actually really good. And this is just something that three guys made. It was crazy good. I was part of a team. I was part of eSports racing before it was even really a thing. It was amazing. It was so fun. But Law VS was my handle. And I just decided to bring it back forward into the future. And I just thought, well, let's just do some F1 content and just ramble because I like doing that. And then the ladder came along, basically, because I did a bit for a video about Aston Martin being climbing the heights uh, to P2 in the constructors. I say, congratulations, Aston Martin, you made it. Now get ready for everybody to be dogging on you. And then, lo and behold, they, they fell down and finished fifth. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just that. It was just a bit. And then suddenly, it, people really responded to it. And then I'm like, okay, this differentiates me. I'm sort of subverting the expectations of everybody having loads of LED backgrounds and all these Philips Hue lights and stuff, which I'm literally, <laughs> the irony is I already have it. So it's just like, I was like, let's just do something else. Just get some like light strips. That means I'm like, I've got some light up in the attic and then just, uh, just, just film it there. And then it's just suddenly on the ladder, man, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Well, it, it is very original. Now, um, I was talking earlier about your uh, sudden rise. Well, to me, it was very uh, sudden because like a year ago, I, I, you know, I didn't see you. And then all of a sudden you're there and uh, getting 30, 40, 50 K uh, views on your videos. But um, did that happen so quickly because you're already experienced with your Dragon Ball channel or um did i miss a whole year have you been at it longer than i think or? no 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 you're right I, I literally um i was sort of just dabbling slowly up until around about this time last year 
so I was like doing all these little things, and then I decided to do a watch along. I was doing watch alongs of the qualifying and the race, and then I did the Australian one for qualifying. And what I didn't know is that don't use F1's live timings because boom, I got a copyright strike, and I'm like, I didn't even use any footage. What? Uh, to quote that new clip from Max, you know, Max Verstappen with his team redline when he was just like that and runs you. Ah! What? <laughs> like, new, new reaction meme, new quote meme done. But it was just like that. I got a strike on it. So that means that that doesn't go away for three months. So I panicked and I deleted everything. So I just deleted pretty much every single video and then slowly re-uploaded the ones I was quite happy with. And it was like, OK, I really, really need to redo what I'm doing. And with each video that I do, I just try and like experiment and just I think that for a start, the ladder is quite clearly a hook as it makes you go, why is this guy on a ladder? What? What's up with that? And then I just talk. I just talk and talk and talk and talk. And nowadays people are just they're bored of the overstimulated content like you get with Mr. Beast and even he's slowing things down. Mm -hmm. So it's just a case of like, I'm just a guy on a ladder. So you don't have to take me seriously. Just listen to me talk. So it's just the, I guess, authenticity in a way. Just like, it's just me talking. And it's not me coming up with some big convoluted things for clicks. It just so happens to get clicks, but it's just me going, I just want to talk about this thing today. I then go and write a script and then boom, that's all I do. Yeah. And then, of course, I'm experienced with YouTube because, um, you know, back in my day, I was making content before Google even bought it. That's a long time ago. <laughs> that's like 2006. So I've been around YouTube as it evolves, and I am an editor by trade, so I'm able to make everything myself. So it means that I pretty much know how to make content about what is good for search engine optimization, experimenting with thumbnails, and just generally just learning things on the fly. It's experience. Yeah. Yes, so you're, you're correct. But the F1 space, I had no idea that it would explode this quickly. I was like... How am I at nearly 50,000 already subscribers? That's crazy. So I had no idea it would be this good. I was quite happy. Like, I think back when I went to do the last lap uh, Qatar recording, I was like at 15,000. I was quite happy being there. I was like, how on earth did I get here? And now it's like, that was a long time ago. That's like six months ago. And things you, have changed considerably. You'll be getting the silver play button this year. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean... I don't know what I'm going to do for under that. I'm, I'm going to have to do an attic tour or something like that just to prove to people it's actually an attic. So maybe. But right now, I'm just quite happy making content because and it's and I'm happy that people are watching it. So like, yeah, it's just an opportunity just to share my passion that I've had for so long. And I've had so few people in which to share it with. Well, one thing I'm very impressed with, and I've told you this in a private message, is um the way you deliver your uh, your lines, uh, you t what you told me is that you sort of learn your script and then um, you start yapping <laughs> and it just comes out because I, I struggle with that. You know, oh. I'm, I'm doing it in a second language and, um, you know, I try to deliver every chapter. I del try to deliver two or three sentences mm. and um, uh, you, should you should see the outtakes that I do. Um, <laughs> It just goes wrong so often. Oh, if it makes you feel any better, like, I go off script so much. I ramble and ramble and ramble, and I quickly take a look at the script just to get me back on back on track, and I'm like, I have veered off so far. I'm not even meant to say that part yet. Oops. I guess I'll have to make do and uh, uh, correct things in post. So I, I ramble. I mainly have the script. I write out a full script just to make sure that I get my notes down. But most of the time, I don't even follow it. It's just like, for the most part, I just I just think, I think I wrote that down. I believe I did. And then I go back in the edit and I look at my script. I, I did not meant, I did not write that down. Right. Okay. So it's well, mainly as long as reference. it's correct. Then, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just a bit extra. Oh, yeah, of course. It's just like, it's me writing things down. Just say, law, just remember you, you should say these things because that, that, that's the point of the video. So don't, don't ramble too much. Yeah. So other YouTubers you actually follow? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I'd followed the likes of Tomo, Aldous, the WTF1 lot for the longest time. And yeah, I still do. And yeah. it was very surreal when I hit like 10K. 
I got this cryptic like thumbs up from Tomo. It was just like, congrats to you, fella. It was just like just a you know Chelmsford accent, but it was just like I was like, Tomo's noticed me. What? It's crazy. But- but I, were you not invited to one of their podcasts as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, I was. I yeah. was. You know, that, that was like um, a month, six weeks before. So that was like at the end of August or something, like at the end of the summer break. And then suddenly I got, I hit 10,000. And then I got that comment from him and that blew my mind. And then like several weeks later, I got an, a DM from Tomo. He followed me on Twitter and it was just like, oh, do you want to like come to the last lap thing? And I was like, oh, that is amazing. That's incredible. And then I went there. I had a blast, but the people in the comments were like, why is this guy talking? He won't shut up. And I'm like, (laughs) I've got to work on that. Okay, uh, let's work on that. I will openly admit that I rambled far too much. It was like, I'm not in my space. I I listened to your... um, um... When you were a guest at the DRS Train uh, podcast, and Mm. uh, you were you were very well behaved there. Uh, I've I've uh, we the DRS DRS Train podcast posse that we've got a system there, and most of the time they just let me run, and then in the in the Discord chat they go like, "Oh, what Law said that could make a really good meme, or that could be a good short." So I I usually end up giving them a fair amount of sound bites and sound quotes from shorts content. So I'm like, "Hey, I'm doing my job," but uh, yeah, I, I do. Make sure to limit what I say now. So that last lap experience was an eye opener. And for anyone that was watching and got sick and tired of me talking, I thoroughly apologize. And I have learned from that experience. Yeah. Well, I was invited um, uh, two weeks ago for the, what was it? The Bahrain um, Rave Review. Oh. And um, that, that was a nice experience. It's nice to, to be in a podcast with a producer instead of... Mm. Uh, me having to do everything myself. Mm, yes. Yeah, um, it just means that, that they can just tell you off and just say, shut up and get on with the next top point. Well, one of the things is that I, I use too many filler words. Like, um, and mm. uh, they, they gave me the advice to um, say nothing and think about what you want to say first. Mm. So that's what I'm trying to do. No, of course. These are the things that you pick up over time, mate. Yeah, it's just a case of uh, you're gaining confidence. And yeah. even with me, I, I still do ums and ahs. And as you say, also, as you see on uh, TV, that there are a lot of people that they pause or they just kind of like they hand it off to somebody else if they run out of things to say. So there are things you pick up on the fly. There really are. Well, I, I've been looking at things much differently now that I'm uh, making content myself, mm. even uh, TV presenters and... Um... Uh, f- for instance, you, you mentioned uh, WTF1, well, uh, Tommy and, um, and and Matt from P1. Uh, Matt Gallagher, he can just rant and rant and rant. <laughs> yeah. But then when uh, Tommy says something, there's a lot of ums as well and um, mm. a lot of thinking. Mm. So it, it's um, it's nice to see those guys who are really popular um, having the, doing the same things. Yeah, exactly. You don't want it too clinical. You, you want no. there to be like, these are thoughts that are coming straight from their minds and that these are people, these are just average fans like us who just so happen to have a following. So that that's the point. I mean, again, I'm just, I'm quite disarming as in like, hey, you can listen to me or not listen to me if you want. I'm just a guy on a ladder. So I'm just, I'm just me. I'm just being mm-hmm. me. Yeah, well, for me, it's a bit different. I, I My motivation to start this YouTube channel, it was because I wanted to um, give a different sound than all the biased uh, British YouTubers that are out there, you know. Um, and this was at the height of the Max Verstappen-Lewis Hamilton uh, fight. Mm. And uh, obviously, people from the same country as Lewis Hamilton have... A different view on things than I had, and I mm. thought I could, I could totally do this as well. And then I made a first video, and it was obviously terrible. And the next ten were also terrible. <laughs> and then you you started getting into the, uh, start watching the, the the YouTube help channels, and you get better at things. And then mm. yeah, uh, over time you get a better microphone, and you get better at ad- editing. And you know I monetize my channel, which I'm very happy with. Hey. Um, and um, 
yeah, now I'm sitting doing a podcast with you, which is also uh, very nice. Right on, right on, that's nice. That, that, that's exactly the right thing to do. I mean, the first few, I look back at those first Law VS things and they just are like, they're not that great. I, no. I've re- I've, I'm really starting, to, I'm just really starting to dip my do- toes into Formula One content. Whereas now it's just a case, you learn things over time, you really do. And you just, you find out new tricks and then you find out like one video does really well and you go, like, oh, bubble that. Why did that do well? And then you look through it and you realize how long did people watch it for? How many people liked it? How did it get recommended? It's that I love statistics. So this helps me out a lot. So I spend nearly most of my downtime when I'm not looking after my new kid looking at analytics. So it's just a case of time. It's the, the statistics help me a lot. And also they can be a crux as well because you go, oh man, 10 of 10. That that's the no no YouTuber wants that to get a ten no. out of ten. No, 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 no. <laughs> but then you, you know the, the the help channels they give you an advice like mm. if you have a, a video that scores really well, try to make a follow up. Mm. So my best scoring video is one about the misconceptions about Jos Verstappen. You know that he was a fast driver instead of the bad driver people think he was. Mm. And um, I thought, okay, I'm going to do a follow up. So I made a video about. His Honda adventure, how in 1999, Honda was building a factory team, um, Formula One team. And at the test, he was crushing everybody because the car was really good. And then Honda, what they always do, (laughs) um, they stepped out of it again and they started supplying, um, was it Mugen or... um, um, Oh, they did BAR. Yeah, Yeah. BAR. Um. And and th- that dream uh, fell apart for uh, Jos Verstappen. Mm. But that video only got like ten percent of the views that my um, my other video for Jos Verstappen got. So, I yeah. mean, with the whole thing about Jos, I, I from the way I see it is like I feel like him coming into Benetton with Michael Schumacher. There's only so much you can do. There is, a, you can only do so much. And that's a Michael Schumacher that's been there for like four se- three and a half seasons. So you just go like, yeah, okay. Um, I hope you, I hope you uh, realize that the first number in your life is two at best. So I just yep. feel like, and also I, I think based in his junior career before then, he was winning everything. So to then suddenly not being the winning factor that must have hurt. That must have been really, really galling to stomach. Yeah, well, that that, that first video is also about uh, about that part. Mm. How, um, like, he got that seat because JJ Leto injured his neck. Uh, that that's how Jos was promoted into a, a team where he was supposed to be a reserve driver and um, mm. and uh, getting ready. But. Um, yeah, to get back on the topic of uh, content creation, um, you seem pretty unbiased uh, yourself. Um, I, the, the only thing I can notice is that you have a little bit more love for uh, the McLaren team. Oh, yeah. I mean, am I, I correct? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I make it, I think it's okay to have bias so long as you. Oh. <laughs> hey! Hey! Nice. Oh, no, I can. Uh... Oh, because uh, the old classic meme is that, you know, it's got to be the McLaren bobble hat of bias. So there you go. <laughs> Do the mutual. So there you this, go. It's this the... will make a great thumbnail. Yeah, it's the bot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I, I think bias is okay. So long as you make it clear. So long yeah. as you make it obvious that, yeah, okay, folks. I'm a McLaren fan. Let's just make that clear. I'm I am a supporter of of them and of course Oscar Piastri. So as long as you make it obvious, then people can just take it with a pinch of salt and go, "Oh, okay, he's just getting on his high horse about McLaren." All right, okay, fine. I sometimes with some biases they are a little bit more obvious than others, but I do try and make it clear by going, "To be fair," or let's just recognize this side of it things. I try and be as unbiased as I can be. But in Formula One, it is quite hard because you do get comments that go, you are such and such fanboy. And then the next video is like, I can't believe you hate this person. Why do you hate this fan? It's like, <laughs> I'm trying, that's the point of trying to be fair and balanced. As in, you could be like, 
I like this driver or the, I like this team, but I don't like what they, they they've done in this instance in this context. So you've just got to like try and balance things up. And even with people you don't like or teams you don't like, if they do something valid, you just got to go credit where credit is due. As in like, okay, that was a good move, or they did really well that time. I can't fault them. So uh, with Haas in Jeddah, I mean, I look at that and I go like, I can't fault that in a way because Haas have gotten the bigger picture. And Hulkenberg has said this too, that all of the bottom five teams have got to try and find a desperation tactics and yeah. weird, wacky strategies to try and get a point because the points are now basically going to be shared between anyone from Aston Martin upwards. So the bottom five teams are going to have to make do with a DNF from the top five or yeah. they're going to have to do something wild and then and maybe get ninth or something if they're lucky. Yeah, and these days uh, a point is uh, enough money to um, pay for all the travels that mm. season. Yeah, so exactly. It's pretty important. Yeah, it, it always I'm has been. a bit warm. <laughs> nah, it's understandable. Okay, the bit's done. The joke is dead. So let me go all the way to the start. Where did your love for Formula One start? Right. So basically, the love for F1 started. Um, Vaguely around about the time of 1997. So basically, my my dad and my brother they they watched Formula One like in back in the 80s. So I think my dad took my brother to Silverstone. I think the year Nigel Mansell won, like I think 91. And I think they they got tickets for St at Stowe. So that was really awesome. So i remember them having a good time there but i remember that will fell out of formula one not long afterwards i don't know whether it was the case of case it wasn't cool anymore or it was just him becoming a teenager and other things were more interesting you know like you know <laughs> other things that teenagers like we'll yeah, keep yeah, this yeah. pg here <laughs> but um i just it was just always in the background and then i started watching properly the races i was watching it on and off in 97 kind of like not really paying much attention but then 1998 came, and I watched the season from beginning to end. So it was like every single race on ITV, and the uh, just watching it every single time. And this was back in the days before you didn't have the practice sessions. You just had qualifying in the race. And it was amazing. And I remember falling into becoming a Schumacher Ferrari fan. And I continued to be so until, well... Schumacher left and Schumacher retired. So I, I was um, a Ferrari Shumi fan for several years. And it just started in 98. And then I remember getting in 2000 where they were buying, they had the reviews, the Duke video reviews on VHS. So I would be collecting them. So I collect them. And I remember going back and wanting to watch some of the older ones. So I remember getting 1994. And then 1995. And I would say, in terms of all of the video reviews, I've subsequently gotten now all of them on DVD, going from like 1970 to 2019. I've got to tell you, the 2018 and 19 reviews are terrible. They, they're they basically just clip shows of the YouTube highlights videos. Like, they're so, so lazy. But the 94 review is probably one of the best ones they did, in that it encompassed so much. And it had, like, bouncing off of two different um, voiceovers. And it had, like, cheesy 90s stock audio, like, proper. It's in my Spotify favorite liked, vi liked audio playlist. Like, um, it's just some of the incidental music that they use. And it was just a really good one. So I caught up with all of those reviews. I then started to figure, learn things, play the video games. As then I played Jeff Cramlin's Grand Prix 3 and Grand Prix 4. I was online leagues playing in like a place called the GPVWC. I think some of the people that worked in it, I think one guy works for Salba, right? In terms of like their ad administrative and PR department. So a lot of these people just grew up. And then I went on to do Live for Speed and all that stuff. But it all started just watching that 98 season between Schumacher and Hakkinen. Okay. And um, you, you stayed a, a fan. And then where did the love for McLaren uh, start? Um, well, I wasn't really a, a big McLaren fan because naturally I didn't want Hakkinen to win. So, But obviously going back and looking at their video and uh, looking at the seasons, 
I obviously grew an appreciation for McLaren and Hakkinen. But it was mainly I started liking McLaren when Alonso moved over there. Because 2012, uh, 2012, it made me realize that, wow, Alonso's incredible. Like, he drove, he drove that car, which should not be a championship contender, to being a championship contender. And that is crazy. That, that was in Ferrari. Yeah, and the fourth yeah. fastest car. And it turned out, oh, he was almost got the title. And that's crazy. And then I, moved, I followed him as he was at Ferrari. And then when he moved to McLaren, I, followed, I went with him. And that was the best time to join. And <laughs> that was the best time. <laughs> if you to have be- very low expectations, then <laughs> that was great. Oh, it was great for sound bites, but I, I stuck with it. I stuck with it because I also like JB. I like Jensen Button as well. Yeah. And then I just, I just kept an eye on them and just kept on watching and I kept on supporting them throughout Did all the Did you ever get to reading uh, Jensen Button's book? The one I suggested? I've or read, no? I've uh, read both of them. Uh, his biography and then How to Be an F1 Driver. Okay. Uh, which one did I suggest to you? The, was it The, the Mechanic from uh, um, Oh, The Mark Mechanic, Priestley? yes. Oh, The Mark Priestley one. Yes, I did. I love reading books. Yeah, no, no, I've been, I've been catching up. Books. I've, I've, I had a glut of Audible credits. So I was like, ooh, I'm going to go and listen to as many of these as I can, including The Mechanic. And that was a really good one. As in, I, I prefer the ones where they actually read it themselves. So okay. I just finished reading Gunther Steiner's book. And I appreciate him draw, doing it himself, but it's slog. It's a bit of a slog. But <laughs> you get used to it because it's Gunther. But he's, he doesn't really read it in the same way that you think. It's not as animated. But it's interesting, though. It's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, but the mechanic, uh, that's a really good one. Total I'll probably read it in, in paperback. No, mm, yeah, it's a good one. Total Competition, the one that Ross Braun and Adam Parr, when they have a conversation together, that's a good one. Um, but yeah, no, the I Jensen... think I have that too. But I, I just started uh, Johnny Herbert's uh, biography. Oh, I I got I've had the one uh, where what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Oh, I have to I have to look out for that one. I, um, I I I've read about two chapters, but I think he's already f- said three or four times that he was uh, killing it. He was seven years old and he was beating everybody on track. <laughs> well, that tends he's, to be most people. He's he's he's, he's not very uh, modest. <laughs> oh, well, to be honest, he is a bit of a uh, pocket rocket. And because I, 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 there's a similar one that I think he did. He did an audio book with Damon Hill, Life in the Fast Lane, where it's like it's them in their racing overalls and they're just talking about their times at similar, you know, at points in their own career and they having a bit of a dialogue. So that's a good one. Um. I did read Lando Norris's one, but I feel like the audio, the person who did the book, read the book, th- there were so many mispronunciations and Carlos Sainz being one of them. Yeah. Ugh. I mean, Ricciardo obviously came up. That always does. Yeah, that, that's not the way to say it either. Yeah, it's, no, don't worry, fella, it's Daniel Ricciardo. <laughs> yeah. Ki 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 ki, ay 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 ay, ki ki So, talking about a couple of uh, great uh, drivers, is there anybody in uh, the F1 paddock, or uh, could be uh, in the past as well, that you would have loved or would like to meet <laughs> and t- have a long conversation with? I'll tell you one thing. Um, I. My wife got me an amazing present to go to the 2020 testing at Barcelona, and it was it had and paddock passes for for the day, and that was amazing. And you're just walking around, and you realise that wow, a lot of the F1 drivers are really short. And yeah. I um I pointed out George, so I was like, look, honey, there's George Russell. And then there was a and it's he's a guy, he's a slim, tall, slim guy in very tight jeans. And then there was a guy who was similar looking, but he had, had like gray hair, right next, like like ten feet next to him. And uh, and then she was like, "He's really old, isn't he?" No, 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 that's not George. That's George. So it's like, <laughs> was it my crack? He's <laughs> tall and skinny, and he has no, gray no. Hair. This this was before he arrived. This was before he arrived at Aston. Um, oh, I I've not. Well, really I, had the I was at Sandford. I was at Sandford last year. Oh yeah, and. Uh, on the Friday morning at about eight o'clock, 
we wanted to be there early because it was a full day. And we decided to go through the gates all the way at the side, but that was just beside the VIP entrance. So I saw my crack coming in and I saw all the, the familiar faces of the engineers of all the teams. And then all of a sudden there was GP. Ooh. And I said, Hey GP. And he looked around and was like, Oh fuck. They, they recognize me. <laughs> and I put my hand forward like this and he bumped it. Hey. And then he just went and he just, and he just went on. <laughs> Before anybody else caught on. Yeah, because, no, it's uh, like he's like, okay, I'll I'll let you have that. <laughs> I'll let yeah. you have that, but don't don't let anyone else know. That's fair enough. But apparently, he's really shy about these things. You know, he doesn't like the attention. Now. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's he's a race engineer, and the race engineers don't often tend to get the limelight. Um, no. But in terms of your question, um, I'd love to have a sit down chat with Mick Schumacher. I really would. Most of the time, okay. we we most we most likely be just gushing about dogs. Because he loves his dogs, and I love my dog. So I'm like, we just spend a lot of time just like rem just talking about dogs. And I say, oh, oh, because I've taken I've taken my dog to Crufts, and have you ever been? Or would you ever like to go? And just dogs. And does he have a German Shepherd? Oh, that's a good question. He has so many. I, I I've lost track. But oh, that's a good question. But I from all of, I I just remember seeing loads of pictures of him with dogs and him just cuddling them and I'm like oh he's not a bad guy he's not he's cost has four million dollars but he's not a bad guy <laughs> well, just... that's quite a surprising answer you know because you, you could have picked anyone you know uh, it doesn't even matter if they're uh, dead or alive you know uh, you know if you wanted to sit down with Senna or uh... oh yeah I mean in terms of the past though I would I would actually really like to have a sit down chat with Ricardo Patrese because he's a guy who saw F1 evolve so much from being in the 70s all the way through to like 1992, 93. And he had such a career where he got quite a few wins and he was a really good, dependable second driver and being a driver in his own right and then ending with Williams. And you feel like, I really want to, I really want to talk to that guy and just really get to know him. And yeah, so that's another guy. Yeah, the, 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 for technical talk, yeah, he'd be ideal, um, you know, as in history-wise. Mm. Um, I, I just read a great book uh, by a Dutch um, writer. I did a podcast with him last month about that book, and it's called um, Formula Hopeless. There's only a Dutch version, so uh, that's going to be hard for you, <laughs> I assume. But it's about all these small teams uh, in the late 80s uh, no, and in the 90s mm. that were so poor that they usually didn't even make it through the pre-qualifying. Oh, yeah, pre-qualifying. Teams like Zach Speed and... Um, I, know, I feel like I'm on the spot now. Well, there's like Coloni as well. Coloni, yes, that's one. Um, but there was one driver called um, um, Modena. No, that's a team. Roberto Moreno, maybe? Moreno. And he was in all those teams. Oh, yeah. No, Roberto Moreno was the handyman of the back of the grid. I mean, I mean, I think he even... I, did, I think at one point he was racing for Benetton. Uh, he got a chance at Benetton, but then that fell through. But he just felt like he, he looked like such a nice guy. And he was like... Really, he was pulling in the job and he was getting, I think, was he at one point, he got some te teams that never qualified into qualifying. And, I mean, the whole concept of pre-qualifying is just a minefield. It's crazy. I really need to make a video about that one day. Yeah, that, um, that, 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 that there were like um, 26 cars allowed, but there were 36 uh, were there. And then the 10 of them had to fight it out before they could even get into proper qualifying. Mm, yeah. Um, a lot of waste of money mm. uh, because those teams, yeah, they, 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 they flew there and uh, there was nothing to, there was nothing for them actually because they weren't good enough that they, they just bought this uh, chassis from, um, what do you call that? Dallara. Mm. And uh, a, they, they chucked a, an old Ford engine in or a, a Cosworth uh, engine, and uh, and, they, and they were a Formula One team. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of these teams were like in Formula 3000 and like some of the junior categories, and they go like, let's do a Formula 1 team. That'll be easy. No. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. I mean, sometimes it can work. I mean, and sometimes it can be somewhat productive. But a lot, a lot oh, of the Simtech time, was another one. I mean, I feel like Simtech had a rough time of it because the association with the passing of Roland Ratzenberger. Mm -hmm. And I believe in 95, they actually had a decent car, but they just ran out of money. Yeah. They ran out of money, but they had a, a car. I think that was... There was a rich not... lady that paid for a lot of it and then it stopped. Yeah, and um, I mean, let's not get started on the whole Mastercard Lola thing. I mean, oh, that's that's one of the teams as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it just you'd love that book. I mean, it's a Mastercard. I mean, with Mastercard, if they just waited for 1998, Lola might have had something good. As in, they might have. I mean, sure, they wouldn't have been like winning races, but they would have certainly been like in the mix with Arrows and and the like. So they would have been in the mix for like Arrows, Sauber. Getting maybe the occasional point or points. So in the midfield, I would say, if they'd started a year later. But no, they were rushed in and they had to make a car in four months. It's like, it's a miracle they even got it on the track. And then you feel like, what would have happened if Vincenzo Sospiri had a car that he could have raced in competitively, considering how Michael Schumacher rated him so well and said, he's an inspiration or he's really good. I really recommend him. And I'm like, well, if you really thought he was that good, why didn't you give him a Ferrari job? So I'm like... Okay, yeah. but it was just unfortunate. Yeah. F F one is full of these stories, you know, mm. like like even those really good drivers now. Would you say they're unfortunate to be paired up in a season with Max Verstappen in a Red Bull that is, you know, the the team is near enough perfect, their car is near enough perfect, he's driving near enough perfect. You know, these, these guys are, if this continues, they're going to finish their career being completely underrated because there's there, there's one uh, driver um, taking all the shine off their careers. I think I saw an interesting stat on Twitter the other day. In fact, I think it was earlier today. Is that since Kimi Raikkonen's last win for Lotus in 2013, there have only been four non from four wins from outside of Ferrari, Red Bull and Mercedes. So those three teams have basically hogged the majority of wins. And there's only been like four in the space of 10 years. Yeah, it would, and be, it would be Gasly. Gasly, uh, Ricardo, Ocon. Ocon, yeah. For Alpine. Yeah. And then Checo. Oh yeah, Checo for a racing point. Yeah, so those four. So the, and and three of those came in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. Two of them came in a pandemic year. So I just feel like, yeah, I, I I absolutely get it. And I feel like a lot of these drivers, like you feel like Lando Norris should have had more, should have had several wins by now. Mm -hmm. You feel like he should have, especially from last year. But yeah, that's the thing. You don't often get these generational talents. I'm, but it, it happens. It happens all the time. Like, in the 80s, you had the mixture of Prost and Senna winning all these races. And then in the 90s, you had Hill and Schumacher and Hakkinen but getting all these wins, the majority of them. Same goes for Schumacher again in the 2000s. And then you had Alonso and Hamilton. And then Hamilton again in the 2010s and Vettel. And you, you, these big superstar talents take up a lot of the wins. It happens. The Stappen just seems to be the next one. And will be on for quite a long time until I think quite simply he just gets bored. He'll just be like, I'm done. Okay, I'm, I'm off. See ya. Because the fact is, though, you see him playing sim, yeah, sim racing at three o'clock in the morning in Jeddah when he really should be up. I think I saw a funny picture. I think he was up too long on Thursday playing. And then you just see loads of pictures. He looked quite bleary eyed. It's like, you've been up too late, sunshine. <laughs> you feel like, but well, then... I think I've seen an interview. He said about it himself that they are on a, they were on UK time, and it wasn't um, it wasn't a weird time in the UK when he was playing. But I'm, done, I'm not sure if that's true though. But I mean, they wouldn't surprise me. It's just the f it's quite clear that one of these days he's just going to go like I'm bored of F1 now. I'm going to go off and do something else, and then he'll be like, Hey Fernando, when you decide you're bored of F1 too, hit me up and we'll set up a Le Mans team. 
and then go oh, yeah, and that, do endurance. That's definitely going to happen. Of course, and yeah, absolutely. And he's got that team red line, and he wants to join. Um, he wants to organize a GT team. Well, he's now. bought a Ferrari already. <clears throat> yeah, he's bought a Ferrari. He's been. T- he's, I think I saw him testing at Portimao. As I saw pictures of him. So I yeah, wouldn't be surprised. That, if isn't that for a, a, a driver he's coaching? The, not, the son of his manager? I'm not sure, but that wouldn't surprise me. But I feel like, um, I do feel like that. But you're saying that that could be a blessing that, you know, before 2028, he says, look, I've won everything that I could win. I wanted to win one and now I've got six and it's enough. Um, I'm getting out of there. And then all of a sudden these drivers that are a tiny bit less they're all going to fight it out because mm. you know if we had a Perez Leclerc uh, Sainz um, who else would be up there Hamilton Alonso mm. you know if, if those five guys would be fighting it out for a title Russell you'd have six guys competing for a title it would be brilliant yeah absolutely I mean the the battle for second that was quite a fascinating one between Checo and Hamilton that went down to the wire and it's just you feel like I mean I think I've done a video or like many people have done videos about like the Red, the championship without Red Bull. It would have been a Hamilton versus Alonso season, and that would have gone down to the wire with Hamilton just getting it, I think. But in any case, it's very true. But I think when Verstappen goes, it's on his terms. As in, like that's when he goes. He's not gonna he's not going to fade away and retire because he feels like he's tired. Ta- because he, he wants to go like, well, I don't want to give up my prime. I want to go and do something else. I want to go off and do Le Mans. I want to go and do World Endurance. I might want to give a crack at something else. And he's perfectly at liberty to do that. And I think the only record, it's my own headcanon theory, that the only record that he really wants is the Grand Slam record from Jim Clark. That's, okay. that's the one I think he really wants. Because that's like total domination. And I think he's got I think Max has got three so far, and I think yeah. the record's eight. Five. Oh, eight? Or six. Eight, uh, grand it, it's at least six, but Jim Clark is the record holder. So I feel like that is the record, that the only one that Max cares about. Again, it's just my theory. Yeah. Well, that, it, he, he doesn't let um, records get to his head because it might give him extra pressure, and he doesn't Oh, want yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. likes to be as based as possible, so mm, no, of course, he's of never course. he's never all that too ecstatic about things, and he's never not uh, never too down about things, just mm. sort of level, and that makes him so boring, according to some people. It's just, I, th- it's, it's, I would describe that, I wouldn't describe that as boredom. I describe that as a matter of fact, and I'm like, oh yeah, me too, you know. And I, I as a Dutchman, uh, we're all very pragmatic and. Um, We don't like to go over the top like Americans do. I'm kind of like this weird person. I'm like, I'm British, but I do. I'm over the top. I'm very mm-hmm. anti. I'm very, I'm I'm off type. I am. And I don't know why. I, I, I mean, I, I kind of do know why, but I don't know why for sure. So I'm like, eh, I'm just like, I'd rather be, I'd rather be daft. Daft and eccentric. That's what I'd rather be. Yeah. No, you, you need to be very rich to be eccentric. Yeah, 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 exactly. Otherwise, you're just weird. Yeah. (laughs) Can be sometimes, depending on the situation. So uh, my next question was about the state of F1 now. Uh, We touched upon it uh, a little bit already. Um, Is it all doom and gloom? Or should we all, as content creators, put our shoulders under it and make the best out of these seasons? Um, I don't think it's... All doom and gloom. I feel like there is something to hope for in that there is plenty of other stuff going on with the other 18 drivers. And not to mention, I still feel like the Sonoda Ricardo situation is a fascinating get- head to head. Not to mention for the fact that the extra peril is coming from twofold. So you've got the Sonoda Ricardo situation, but then in comes the Checo doing well, and then in comes the Lawson getting extremely aggressive and going, like, you gotta step it up, Daniel. And like, I want that seat. Because as soon as I saw him drive to survive the episode where Liam was in it, and I'm like, he vocally said, it should have been mine. I, yeah. I should have had that. And I didn't get it. You could tell he was pissed. He was so mad. And I'm like, oh, oh, you are not happy with that deal. As in, it's like, hey, Liam, 
you can have more time in the simulator. Uh, competition? Um, uh, oh, oops. Uh, Iwasa's taken your seat in Super Formula. Uh, oops. That, that's the thing. Liam's doing all of this time in the simulator. I don't think... I, maybe he might get some time in the RB18. Maybe. But it's hard to say. He can't, he can't be in FP1 sessions anymore because he's done like five Grand Prix. He's done the, the most... He, I think he, you can only be in two Grand Prix. Um, yeah. No more than two Grand Prix and then you can't be in FP1 tests anymore. So Lawson can't do that anymore. So you just feel like, yeah, no, Lawson kind of got like messed around with because he did the business. I mean... But you know what's a little bit ironic? Um, over the years, Red Bull, especially Helmut Marko, has been criticized for dropping youngsters into a team too quickly. Mm. Like Gasly was only a 19 year old kid in what was it 2019 and after six races I think they saw this is not going to work. Then they picked up Alex Albon who only had the, those few races in Toro Rosso and they put him in the big team. And that went okay for that season and then the next season, yeah, it it all sort of um, went to hell a bit for him and uh, his confidence was shot. And then afterwards, people saying like, yeah, you know, th th they're dropping these guys in and then they're dropping them again. And it, it was way too soon for them. So they got a an outsider and then people started saying, well, what do you have your junior team for if you get an outsiders to put in your team? So then they put in uh, Nick De Vries because... Um, uh, Max Verstappen uh, said that he was a good driver and um, Helmut Marko wanted to please Max. Uh, that was 10 races of nothing. So he got dropped for Daniel Ricciardo because he wanted to get back into, into the fold. And now there's a youngster who's been through the whole junior program who's shown that he's a great driver and he's sitting there doing nothing, waiting on one of the two drivers in, um, in RB to uh, fail. Yeah, it, it's kind of uh, ironic that, that the thing that they got, you know, criticized for is the reverse is happening and they're getting criticized for that now. Mm. I, I've, uh, it, it, it's true. It, it feels like a case, if only, if only Carlos hadn't jumped ship and Daniel hadn't jumped ship, I think the succession plan would have been a whole of a lot smoother because Carlos left for Renault because it was quite clear that he wasn't going to go anywhere. And not to mention, there was a lot of tension between the, da the dads of Jos and Carlos Senior. And that was just going to boil over. Then he goes off to Renault. He does his own thing. He finds his feet okay. And then Daniel goes off. He leaves uh, to Renault. He actually was pretty good there. But then he decided to jump ship too early. He jumped ship before the 2020 season even started. And he realized, oh, this is actually not a bad car. As in, I could get podiums. Oops. And, uh, yeah, so I feel like the Red Bull succession plan would have been a whole of a lot smoother if Carlos and Daniel had not moved on. Or at least, you know, Carlos stayed. Yeah. I, it's, it's my own headcanon in terms of, like, I kind of want the chaos version. I want Carlos to get a seat of Red Bull next to Max. Round two, bring it on. Oh, I'd love that too. But you know uh, who else didn't like uh, Carlos Sainz going to Renault? Oh. Uh, Jolly and Palmer. Oh, of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, last summer I handed uh, Laura Winter from F1 TV uh, a bunch of flowers in Zandvoort in a beach tent. And uh, Julian Palmer and Will Buxton, they were all there. So well, we were invited to stay for a bit and uh, we had a chat. But I was sitting next to uh, Julian Palmer and I was sitting chatting away. And then he asked me uh, what I thought about Nick de Vries. Um, losing his seat and uh, if I thought it was unfair so I started going on a whole story about you know at least Red Bull gives drivers chances because um, you know George Russell was stuck in uh, Williams for three years and Ocon was sidelined for a year you know so being in the Mercedes junior team is not as much fun as being in the Red Bull junior team because at least in the Red Bull team you got a you, you get a chance and then he, he sort of got a little bit snappy with me you know, going on about like, uh, yeah, but Red Bull is dropping uh, drivers and it's not good for their careers. And, you know, you need to think about uh, what it does to a driver when he's dropped. So we sort of left it and we chatted about other stuff again, you know. 
And then at home, I realized that he was dropped two races before the uh, for the season ended in 2016 to be replaced by um, by Carlos Sainz, and and that's probably why he was a little bit a little bit more worked up about it. Yeah. No, of course. Because it's it's not nice to um, to sort of lose your, lose your career like that. Yeah, no, of course, and. Yeah, I, I, I feel like the, the De Vries move was just a mismatch, quite frankly. It was just like, it was like, it was a magpie moment for Marco in the sense of like, oh, he did really well in this race. I want to hire him. And he's a Mercedes guy. That, that, De Vries was a Mercedes guy. That's how it was. And I still find it funny that the Mercedes junior team only exists because they failed to get Max. They failed to get Max. They took too long. <laughs> and then Toto's like, Oh my god, we actually we actually we need a junior team of our own. And so basically <laughs> just they cobble this thing together. And then fortunately it's working out because at the moment they got they got a couple of good ones. They got well they've got Antonelli, and now as we've seen in the F1 Academy, they've got Dorian Pin, who's actually quite good, and dominating everything. And you feel like, oh good, in F1 Wasn't Academy. There a, got... a Danish guy as well from the Mercedes. Uh... Oh yeah. Can't quite remember his name. Uh, let me just double check that because I, because, <laughs> ooh, that's, we could just take a look at that current roster. Something with an E. Oh, Vesti. 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 Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. No, that's the thing. I felt really bad for him because in the Mexican race, when he got the FP1 session, he wasn't allowed to put on soft tires. He was only allowed to do hard, hard run stints. And now he's doing European Le Mans. And... I also felt bad for, uh, I think it was Crawford and Hajar who were doing the FP1 sessions for Red Bull in Abu Dhabi. And they basically were like, we couldn't really push the car because we didn't want to break them. We didn't want to damage the cars for like Max yeah. and Checo. So it was really like, aw. They didn't, they didn't even really get a chance to race the cars properly. No, that's too bad. But um, yeah, the Mercedes Junior program, uh, it started because... They couldn't get Max, and then they started their own pro program, and mm. that's going well now. Yep. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say about that? No. You... No. No, that's it. Um, okay, let's talk about the 2024 season. Uh, what do you think is, what do you think are going to be the biggest narratives to follow in the 2024 season. Well, as I said, the Sunoda Ricardo thing, I I think that's going to be a fascinating um kind of thing right as it that. evolves. That's too for sure. Sunoda Ricardo versus DR. Mhm. Mm yeah, absolutely. Um I also think that the Carlos signs retribution arc will definitely be a thing. To like, you know, Carlos is going like no guys, no. No, this is not good. Stop it's inventing. A, so yeah, no, no, it's, like, it's just like no guys, no no guys, you, you don't fire me. And then then it suddenly just goes boom, and then he real, and then he outscores Charles again. And then, um, I also think that. Do you think Hamilton's going to be okay this season? Um, I, it depends. I feel like the W fifteen. I don't think it's going. It's not going to set the world like right now. Of course not. It's a brand new car, brand new concept. Both drivers think it's got potential, more potential than the other cars have had. But I don't really see that car being fully competitive until like Canada or something like that. By the time you get but, to the eighth or ninth race or something. Yeah, see, I, I'm not much uh, of a technical man, you know. Um, mm. So the, all the ifs and buts on the W15, uh, half the stuff I, do, I don't understand anyway mm -hmm. but i do see that lewis hamilton in his interviews and the way he moves through the paddock and everything um i feel he's kind of switched off a little bit like i've had it in my notice and um mm. you know i'm gonna sing this season out and like the the, the two previous years he, he was angry about not having a good car and you could see a, cer a certain fire but you know since he's not going to be driving the w16 uh, th that fire has gone out as well and i think mm. george russell will benefit from that big time yes i feel like the the narrative there is that george russell now knows he's going to get the dream of being the team leader 
And I feel like he suits the modern Mercedes these days because they're very technical. They're very transparent. They very much like to explain things away as they do with their race reports. And you just got George going, right, come on, chaps. Right, we got this to do. Right, let's just, you know, give him a pencil thin moustache. And then he'll be, he could be like a corporal or a sergeant in the army. He's like, right, what oh, chaps? Let's get things gone. Oh, oh, sugar, where's my tea? How do you think he would look with, um, what do you call Damon Hill's father? He had a nice moustache. Oh, pencil moustache. It's a pencil moustache. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Like Oh, clipped in, give George Russell a clipped English accent. I, I think he suit the job. But the thing is, though, is that I just feel like... You just put that picture in my head. I just feel All like... All right, chaps. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, come on, chaps. Yeah, absolutely. It's the way he speaks. It's very, very serious. Very, very stern. Very stern. And also, I'll say this it's... while I take my shirt off. Is that sweat in your helmet? <laughs> yeah. So that's... I feel like he'll be all right. But I feel like with Hamilton, there was a piece that Racing News 365 did and they were analysing Hamilton. And it seems like what he's doing right now is that he is experimenting with trying to get the car just right with the way he likes the car. And it's taking up too much time in... get Yeah, there's, no, there's not much time in practice to just do that instead of just going, yeah, that setup will do. So there's a lot of time sorting out the setup to be just so, whereas in just settling for a setup that will be adequate. So if you're like... And then you hear that I think Mercedes are going to do more experimenting in Melbourne. And then there might yeah. be rain in FP3. So that's a little bit risky. So I feel like I think Mercedes will do better here in Melbourne at some of the low speed tracks. But I think it will take some time for them to actually get better. Yeah, but if they're going to be testing stuff on their cars, then um, that's going to take performance away uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, of course. I feel like also I really want to see what McLaren do because... This is the first year they've had since 2021 when they've had a decent start. And yep. they are currently P3, which I'm very happy about. And I just feel like, ultimately, I want to see what they can do and whether this upgrade path this season is just as good as last year. And they can go from duking it out with Mercedes to going up next to Ferrari, maybe getting slightly past them and getting closer to Red Bull. Because Red Bull, uh, I think Paul Monaghan, the head of engineering there, said is that the RB20 is the last roll of the dice. As in, like, yeah. this is our last big upgrade or this is our last big step forward in this pu in this development cycle. So next year is basically just going to be an evolution of what we did already, which we've mostly done already. So you feel like, okay, that might be some salvation for some of the other teams thinking, okay, there is an end point. So I wouldn't be surprised in 2025 we get some teams going, you know what, screw it. Let's just develop for this year and go all in. Get that prize money. So I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if we get Sauber and like maybe even uh, racing bulls or something like that. Just going hell for leather in 2025, upgrading the car still, not really thinking of 2026. And then just trying to get some headway, more prize money to invest in the team. OK, yeah, well, you're going a step further now to 2025. But um, how do you see Aston Martin in 2024? Um. I feel like they're not going to be quite as good, but mainly just for the fact that all of the other teams are a lot more clued up than they were last year. Aston Martin came out of the gate fully understanding what the rate their car was. They fully got it. Yeah. But I feel like this year, a lot of the other teams have. But you'd say that they could build on that then? I think they could. I think, I think the fact that they were able to turn that car around around about Qatar and start getting some decent points again after a dearth of not really scoring much at all, Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a good idea. It's like, okay, that's good that you've been able to find yourself with that upgrade path, which wasn't working, and then start anew. And now they're going to have this new wind tunnel. And so long as the correlation is good with what they got on, got on track, they'll be fine. I feel they'll be, they'll be yeah. okay. They're certainly going to be, they're certainly in the top half of the teams. But but that's, that's the thing with these long seasons, you know, like when we had um, 16 uh, races, if you were bad the first eight, then you could forget about it. But... You could be uh, lower midfield uh, eight races before the end, mm. you know, say race 16. And then all of a sudden in the last eight races, you can uh, climb all the way up to the, um, to the third spot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same thing can happen with Alpine. They might bring an upgrade package, which is really, really good. And lo and behold, they're back to where they were in 2022. Did they did they implement that triangle system as well with the that one head the three prong overseeing? the three prong approach as in they've yeah. got they got the th they got a car concept person mm. aero and engineering like McLaren yeah because uh, it was a mess there with all the people leaving 
I think uh, 20 people, good people, have left there in the last uh, three, four years. I don't think I've seen this many people leave in quick succession. It's crazy. Like, this isn't a brain drain. It's a brain evacuation. Um, but you, you'd say that, you know, that they've started over now, so it, they could be all right if all the toxicity is left now. Yeah, so long as I, that's the case. What, I, what yeah. I keep hearing is that, that, that Lorenz... Um, um, Laurent uh, Rossi, mm-hmm. that he was uh, the culprit in most of the badness. Yeah, I feel like the rhetoric that he was making really did not help. It was not good. It was not motivational at all. No. So what other teams do we have left? Do you think Steak is going to be any... I feel they have a very, very. There's very little motivation to make anything out of it because they're waiting uh, until it's Audi. Uh, no, I think they. I think they want to try and get a new concept <clears throat> going. And I feel like so far, Zhou Guan Yu has had a couple of good, solid, mature um, performances. And he would have been in the hunt for getting that tenth place on, alongside Nico had that pit stop issue not inflicted both drivers. Yeah. So I feel like uh, hard to say. I don't feel like they're really at the back. I mean, Alpine, they're going to be stuck at the back for a while. Haas, though, they're a bit of a dark horse. I'm like, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, how are they? I don't know where they are right now. As in, are they actually last or were they sandbagging? Did they take a leaf or two out of Mercedes' book and go like, we're just going to lower expectations and then see if people don't notice us? Well, what I noticed during testing is that they were just doing long runs, long runs, long runs to get mm. to get on top of the tire uh, degradation. Yeah, that's exactly and what that, they need to do. And that that has worked. So yeah. I, I, I had them slotted in uh, P10, even worse than P10 last year. But um, as it turned out, uh, I, I think they might finish P9 or P8. Yeah, no, I think so. Because Haas, no, Haas has a plan. And Komatsu now has the power in which to act uh, to make it happen. And I yeah. think that's good. As in, that's the thing. If you can get over those fundamental flaws, that car has the potential to be good. And at least those Hulkenberg Q3 performances can translate to some actual points. Yeah, especially in sprint, sprint races where there's less laps to be overtaken. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So that's something to look forward to. Mm. So it brings me on to the next uh, topic. Um, are you going to any races? Uh, Well, no, unfortunately not. I mean, especially no. with a kid, I, yeah. I really don't have time. I'm making content every day. It's really hard. And also, I can't guarantee that every single hotel has an attic that I can go and film up in, let alone a ladder. But, yeah, uh, but, but I'm I'm sure you can skip uh, making contact for uh, for a couple of days. To, no, to see, no, to see your passionate. Oh no, no, no! The YouTube algorithm—it's it, a cruel, unforgiving mistress. As in, like you know, I can't I can't give that up. So unless I unless I find a way to be able to make content every day on the road, but I mean. I would love to. I would absolutely love to. I mean, the race that I would absolutely love to go and see, all hot, all access would be Suzuka, because I would love to go to Japan. The, the as Japanese. Well. I mean, I've been to Japan, and it's oh, you have. Yeah, no, it's it's really, it's a lot of it's a lot of good fun, especially around Christmas time. I mean, so long as you make sure they have plenty of cash, because the ATMs shut around around New Year's. Okay. And also, ironically, we had the Christmas KFC. That KFC, Japan KFC, has chicken nuggets. No other KFC I know has. They've got chicken nuggets. The UK okay. KFC doesn't. And I'm like, how can, how does it not have chicken nuggets? It's crazy. But either way, the Suzuka Grand Prix, that track is amazing. I like the fact that it's actually quite good value. I like the fact there's so much entertainment. There's a dedicated spot for photographers. And that people stick around for hours and hours just watching the race happen again. On the, on the big screens, whilst every, all of the teams are just like, are decanting and packing things up. You feel like there's, a, there's an activity going on all times for enthusiasts. So you feel like if you were a complete F1 anorak, you'd be welcome there. And yeah, yeah I, I would, that's the one I would love to go and see. Yeah, well, I'd love to go to Japan as well, because what I'm hearing is that country is super clean and the people are super polite. Yep. And uh, it's, it's kind of out of worldish how how the mentality is there. So that's something I'd love to see. Mm. Then obviously I, I'd love to go to Australia. That's a country that I've always wanted to visit. Mm. I want to go to Silverstone because that's the 
kind of the holy grail of Formula One. Yeah, I've, I've been to some testing events like back in 2004. There's some very no, shaky I, camera footage. I want to get on my knees and kiss the tarmac. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got like, I we were based at like Woodcott and I got to hear the Honda engine of Button as he was going around and it's insane. Like every time, you know, just go like, <laughs> like, yeah, like the gear changes with punching you in the face. It's like so good. So you get to hear, I got to hear the V10s in person and mm. that was so good. So no, Silverstone, I've only tackled, I've only seen, I've only been there in testing. And back in testing in 2004, that's just Renault and McLaren just doing a private test. And then there's a burger van, maybe. It, it was very old school. Yeah, you don't live too far away from Silverstone, do about you? About two and a half hours. I'm actually oh, closer to Brands Hatch. Brands Hatch oh. is only about 40 minutes from me. Right. Mm. Okay, well, that, I'm I'm only 40 minutes away from the Zandvoort track. Nice, nice. And um, with the way transport is uh, organized here, I if I, my wife brings me to the train station, then uh, there's a, maybe a 20-minute drive to... Um, Haarlem, which is the capital of that province, and then uh, a bus takes you right to the gate of the of the track. Oh, that, well, that that public transportation that sounds amazing. I mean, it is. That's what that's why I'm really kind of looking forward to that Madrid Grand Prix. That the transportation links seem really good. Like, okay. it's a five minute. Like, you're the only link. one that's looking forward to that. Yeah, uh... no, I'm like the transportation <laughs> connections seem remarkable. I mean, it's a shame that everybody not... hates street tracks. I mean, it's a it's not a fully street. It's not fully. It's semi permanent. But I do, I am confused why they're not just re renovating Harama, which is nearby. But at the very least, the transportation links seem really good. Like you can literally just get out of the airport, get on a train for five minutes, and then you're at the track, mm -hmm. and that make it so convenient. Yeah. So because I, I've been to Spa, and uh, it's a three hour drive from where I live. Um, now I was with my brother and he knew how to skip a lot of cars that are, uh, sort of waiting to take the, what do you call it? Slip road? Yeah. Motorway? The, yeah. To, to, to take the motorway off the motorway towards the... Oh, the slip road uh, off the, the junction off yeah. the motorway. And everybody just waits in line, but if you keep going, going, going to all the way to the end, you can slip in. So that 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 saved us uh, a couple of hours of uh, standing <laughs> in, uh, in a um, gridlock. But um, yeah, if it's raining, then uh, you can barely get your car out of the field where you parked it, and you know it's a seven-kilometer walk to get to the <laughs> to the to the actual part of the track where you can stand. Mm. And then no matter how early you get there, the the because I had bronze tickets, um, the TVs to follow the race, they're all the, those spots are all taken, you know. Hmm. So that that's not ideal. That was much better in uh, Austria and in Sandford. Much better. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to go see uh, go to the circuit of the Americas. That seems like a good time, but it seems so super busy. And I'm not gonna lie. I'd actually like to go ve go to Vegas. I'd like I'd like to. I'd be like, bring it, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it'll be an experience. I, I feel uh, like yeah. you know what the first Vegas race that was not bad. It's got some quirks, and I feel it's got some quirks in that it's super cold and that it offers something different. It offers a challenge. So I'm like, okay, I want to see this happen again. I, I'm I'm reserving judgment. I'm like, okay, all right. This isn't bad. Not too shabby, F1. So now do if, it again. If, if you got an email from a uh, ticket service, uh, F1 ticket service, and they say, um, La Lawrence, we, we want to sponsor you if you, um, uh, you know, make a, a minute advert to put in five of your videos and uh, you get tickets and um, plane tickets for Las Vegas, you'd go? I would certainly consider it. It depends yeah. on whether or not, you know, it's a, it, it could be for any other track. I mean, mm -hmm. Las Vegas, it interests me. It intrigues me. As in, like, I want to see more of this. I want to see whether it's not just a fluke. But if, you, if you'd have made it for something like, if this had been for Suzuka or for Austin or, like, oh, 
well, Spa would be definitely a good one. Um, Monza as well. I'd be all up yeah. on those. Absolutely. Love to go to Italy as well. Monza is definitely something I'd really like to see. But if it was any for a European track or Melbourne, I mean, Albert, Albert Park is always something I quite like. Or Interlagos. I mean, Interlagos, I still find it's a crime that there's no Brazilian drivers in F1 right now. Yeah. It's, cra- it's crazy. Hopefully, Bortoleto gets a chance. Yeah. Um, Drogovic is, uh, is he, I think he's half Brazilian, isn't he? Yeah. And he's, I think he's got a, ch- he's got a gig with the European Le Mans team right now for this season. Oh. But yeah, he's, he's the biggest example of reserve driver purgatory. As in just oh, like, yeah. he's stuck being a reserve driver and there's no getting out of that. So we're going towards the end of the podcast. Um, is there a well prediction you want to do before we say our goodbyes? Um, Something for the 2024 season. Oh, I predict that we will see Alex Albon have more, have more than one top five finish. Okay. That's what I say. I'm going to predict that we will see Alex Albon in the top five. At least twice. At least twice. Okay. Well, my prediction that I've done a few times now in the podcast this season is that um, it's it's a really wild one. But there's, there's going to be a crazy race at some point and either Gasly or Ocon are getting a podium, a P3 somewhere. Ooh. <laughs> I would yeah, say... But towards the end of the season. Yeah, okay. You know, when everybody's forgotten that I've said this. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm... <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be surprised what happens with that Gasly-Ocon dispute. But I definitely think that Gasly is building that team around him. Yeah, is he pulling some strings to get things... Uh... I wouldn't say he's pulling strings. I just think he's saying the right things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and o- Ocon has always been um, a little troubled, especially with teammates. Well, I mean, y- you know... Even with Alonso, who's never fallen out with a teammate in his life. I mean, you know, it's just if, no, no, no. Of course no. not. No, no. <laughs> Unless your name's Stoffel. <laughs> no, Stoffel von Dorn. He was good with. No, he's, he had no beef with Stoffel. No. It's okay, like well, it's like with Lewis. You know, everyone forgets. Hey, what about Heike Kovalainen? He was a teammate. He was a solid guy. Yeah. Yeah, there was not much trouble with Heike Kovalainen. No. No. So. um... For the people watching, where can we find Law VS? Well, you just have to search for Law VS on YouTube. Uh, in terms of Twitter and Instagram and Blue Sky, you just find me as Law VS or Law VS X because somebody took the Law VS thing on Instagram and Twitter. So just either Law VS or Law VS X, and then you will find me. Okay. Well, people. That's it for this podcast. Uh, look Lovies up because he has these lovely 16 to 20 minute videos with complete rants about everything that's happening in F1 at the minute. Uh, you'll thoroughly enjoy it. And uh, in the meantime, keep watching my content as well. And uh, Lawrence, thank you very much for being a guest on this show. And um, hopefully we can do this again at some point. Yeah, no, very. thank you very much for having me. Okay, bye-bye.